it's a most curious paradox that those philosophers of the 19th century who denied the supernatural origin of man and who insisted that man is simply a part of nature, one of the members of nature, nevertheless set up a state of alienation between man and nature without precedent. I am a part of nature. I am something that nature uh, fluked into being. But nevertheless, this fluke is something that nature doesn't care about. It doesn't care about my ego and its future. All that is important to nature is the species. The individual is irrelevant. At the same time, this philosophy uh, arose when we were be becoming conscious of the sheer magnitude of the universe. And it took the first impression of this vastness as a pretext for making little of human beings and saying, what do you matter in this huge cosmos? You're just a little fluke. You're just a little nothing at all. This thing goes way on, 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 on beyond all imagination. And therefore man is just so much fungus on a rock and a very tiny rock at that. In other words, it took the standpoint. Let's set up a scale between two limits. We will, and this is the traditional Western uh, opposition. On the one end of the scale to the left here, you have matter. The inert, the clay put into shape by the potter. On the other end of the scale you have spirit, which is intelligence. And these are what the mathematicians call limits. And a limit is something you approach, but you never actually get there. Now, what the 19th century mythology did was to think of all things towards the limit called matter. It said, in effect, uh, there is this dead material stuff it is energetic, but the energy is unintelligent. It's an, uh, a, a kind of um, roaring mechanical energy like fire or electricity or so on. It is not intelligent. And everything is really that. What we call human intelligence and consciousness are merely complicated forms of this primordial energy. And... Uh, they are nothing but that. Uh, in the same way, we are evolved from lower orders of animals. And I can trace my ancestry to a protoplasmal globule, as Poobah says. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what you really are. You're only a complicated protoplasmal glo globule. Now, do you see the intent behind this mythology? The intent is to deprecate. The intent is, as we say now, to put down the human being because the human being felt that hitherto he had been put up too far in the wrong way. You are a child of God, and the Lord loves you very dearly, but... You know? Uh, that's just insufferable to be put up in that way. You have an immortal soul. Your life is endless, but it can very well turn out to be a life of endless agony when you fry in hell. And that was a very serious threat to both of Protestants and Catholics. And so it's much better much more comfortable to have a dead universe than a living universe so everlastingly threatening. So then, the mythology <coughs> of the 19th century, <coughs> under which most of us still operate, 
because we, we operate under it because it has become so plausible. The, the science out of which this mythology arose has been so effective, it has produced such a marvelous splash of technological marvels that its point of view or the point of view of those scientists who started the whole thing going has become amazingly persuasive and convincing. After all, if I can reach into your brain with a very, very subtle instrument and I can poke about inside and press there and suddenly, on a certain point when I press it, a world of memory comes to life so vividly that you see it before your very eyes. I remove the instrument, it vanishes. I touch another place. You experience uh, intense pleasure absolutely unbelievable pleasure I remove it the sensation vanishes <coughs> every time I touch inside you get a sensation externally of intense reality and I say after all I was only just pushing things in your brain you see what a push button thing you are that's it I can just poke around and you can see anything <laughs> but all that's happening is I'm uh, putting a little electrode or something on certain parts of your brain that's all you are poor fish you're just a, you're just that kind of a sensitive sponge inside your head bone. <laughs> well, that gets very persuasive, you see. And people are therefore in a position, they are prejudiced to favor a mythology that will make out that you are after all nothing but something or other. Nothing but a kind of... Uh, complicated neurological jello and that point of view as I said has become enormously convincing it's plausible today whereas the old point of view of God the Father and all the angels isn't plausible it's, uh, it seems kind of weird in relation to what we know about the state of the universe Now, what we have to see is that both of these points of view are equally mythological. And there's no more reason to take one than the other. And that what these points of view reflect are nothing other than certain attitudes to, to living. Now, you see, if you want to live in a way that always is saying I think that life is disgusting supposing you want to deny being then you can always describe it in ways that are offensive you can always say playing the violin is just scraping cat's entrails with horsehair that puts it down and you say you know and you say people who play golf they're a bunch of idiots who go out on a uh, uh, take a walk and they hit a stupid little ball with sticks or that uh, people who um, like music are just a bunch of idiots who sit around and go out of their minds listening to a lot of complicated noises see there's always a way of talking about something to make it sound terrible equally there's a way of talking about something to make it sound great. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to live your life in such a way that you're always saying to it, mm, mm, yeah. you know? do you want to, is, is that a good way to conduct things? Or do you want to live your life in such a way that you, you, you say, come on, let's go, you see, let, let's, let's, let's swing this thing. On the one hand, you see, you're always in tension against it. Do you remember I pointed out to you in, the, in this morning that the person who's anxious, constantly anxious, is the person who is resisting the flip-flop ability of things. Life is vibrating. It's going blip, 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 blip all the time. And the anxious person says, God's sake, don't do that. Because, you know, <laughs> you might do it too much. <laughs> I don't want to blip like this. It makes me feel nervous. <laughs> Stop it. And so, as he puts his weight on this blip blip, he goes <laughs> like this, you see, it gets trembling. So instead of him saying, come on, let's blip, see, let's go, and, and do this thing, 
so in exactly the same way, the person who wants to say, well, you're nothing but, uh, you're nothing but uh, some kind of chemicals, and uh, they're just a lot of... <sighs> you're a bag of pus and blood, basically, with a few bones inside. And uh, that person is doing the same thing, you see, as the person is putting pressure on the flip-flop ability of things, and so he gets anxious. And the person who does this, uh, he wants to say, he's always, look, think about your friends and the people who are philosophical and enthusiastic materialists. They're always going to pose themselves as a certain kind of hero. After all, you're just a dreamer, but I face facts. See? I'm a hard-headed realist. And I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I'm an intellectual porcupine. I have my prickles out all over the place because I'm the kind of person who, in the academic world at any rate, is full of rigor. I ask, what precisely is the evidence about this? And uh, I'm analytical. <laughs> and I'm... Uh, believe in uh, I, I don't like woolly and vague thinking I like it clear cut and you can see that porcupine's bristle going <laughs> right through like that see well this is a personality type who, who wants to play that role whose message in saying all this jazz is I'm the kind of person who is all dry as a bone but I believe that that is strength, and that's reality. <clears throat> and another kind of person says to him, Oh, you are intolerable. You're so dry, you're so dull. You rattle. You don't have any juice in you. And what we need is juice. And uh, we need flow. We need uh, lilt and rhythm and gaiety, you see. So that's an opposed mythology. And that's another character part you're going to play. But so we've got to consider these are games, you see, as, as I tried to show you earlier. <clears throat> the, the kind of roles we play are the kind of games we play. So, but the question is, which is the optimal game? Certainly we can't do without some prickly people. Because life is prickles and goo. <laughs> And uh, it, it's basically gooey prickles and prickly goo, but the gooey people are always trying to make out that it's only goo, and the prickly people are always trying to make out it's only prickles. And we do need both, see? Uh, but the question is fundamentally, which game works better? The game that resists the vibration, the flip-flop, or the game that goes with it? Obviously, the game that goes with it, that cooperates with the general scene, will be a longer game and a more amusing game than one that totally resists it. Although, I don't want to, I said totally, advisedly, because it's great fun to resist it at times. See, it's just like um, <clears throat> uh, when somebody massages you, you know, and they're really expert, and those fingers are just vibrating like this on your back. You can give and just go, woof. But it's also fun sometimes to tighten yourself, your muscles against it, so as to feel the full impact of this thing, you see? But what I want to, the, the, the real point I want to get across is that what seems to us the hard-boiled common sense of a mechanistic view of the universe is nothing other than a myth. You don't have to be taken in by this because there is no more solid argument that that is the way things are than any other argument about any other way things might be. Now, it goes like this, you see. Again, Think of the idea of limits. We'll take different limits this time. We'll take one limit on the right hand here as consciousness. Extreme, lively sensitivity. And on the other hand, we'll take the opposite limit, which is geological. The stone. 
the blind energy, the electrical force without any consciousness whatsoever. These are observable things. We see the living human being on one extreme and we see the stone or the fire on the other. Now, our 19th century mythologist wants to describe this limit in terms of this one. He wants to say that consciousness is nothing but a very complicated form of minerals. Why can't you go the other way and just as easily say minerals are a very simple form of consciousness? That works, doesn't it? I mean, after all, here is this mineral. I knock it and it says that to me. This is a rudimentary form of consciousness. This thing inside is not making a noise to itself because that requires ears. But in some way, this thing is going to itself. It's shaking like that. And that's its consciousness, its response, its resonance. It isn't totally unconscious. But its consciousness is extremely simple. Now, you may think I'm spinning fairy stories. But is that any more of a fairy story than to say that your consciousness is nothing but chemistry? I mean, you think you're conscious and that you have this high and mighty state of affairs, but actually, of course, if we look at this very realistically, all this is just um, colloidal substances bobbling around. See, both uh, that, that, that story uh, and the other story can be made to seem equally fanciful. But the question is this. If I say about the gong, look, my friend, I respect you because you are a little bit conscious. See, You relate to me, you're, you're kind of a younger brother. And, um, you know, then uh, there's something endearing and warm about this attitude to things. Whereas if I say, Psht, you're just a piece of metal, and as a matter of fact, I'm just a piece of metal too. That's a kind of insult. Now the people who believe that are really suicidal maniacs. They want to put themselves down. They are against their own life. And they take a great pride in being that way, and they call it being realistic. And uh, it's, I, I'm only saying it's a better gamble to take it the other way and say uh, the best thing you can say about it, that this is a living being, but not so much of a living being as a snail or something that actually wanders along and wiggles. <laughs> So, you see, the pressure upon us of the whole mythology of the 19th century, the whole attitude of putting down the universe because the previous myth had been too uncomfortably alive, is simply a way of looking at things. Let me give another illustration of the same thing. <coughs> If you study the various forms of life from the standpoint of natural selection, you may come up with a rationalization for everything. Somebody wants to know, why do butterflies have eyes on their wings? Some butterflies. Well, somebody scratches his head and says, oh, well, there must be an explanation for that. There's an explanation for everything. Why is there an explanation for everything? Because the universe is really a tight engineering job. So, why do some butterflies have eyes? Well, it so happened that some fluke of a butterfly once got an eye on its wing, and birds would avoid it because that eye looked at them and it was just too much. <laughs> so those butterflies that had eyes on their wings bred, whereas the butterflies that didn't have eyes got eaten up more easily. Although some of them had other alternatives, they, because of not having eyes, they were invisible and the birds couldn't see them. And so more of that kind survived, although those with the terrifying eyes survived, 
And uh, so they didn't get eaten up either. So those it, it tended to multiply. So this is a perfectly easy, simple explanation of why butterflies have eyes on their wings. Also other things, uh, some birds with extraordinary plumages, which look uh, so obvious that uh, anybody could catch them, any cat, any hunter. No, they survived because they were so attractive to their females. And so they bred very well. As a matter of fact, this isn't true. They didn't. And, uh, uh, you know, but any explanation will do, provided it seems to explain. Now, that is one way of looking at things. You can make an extremely consistent theory for the different kind of species of flowers and birds and insects and all their markings and so on, just why they have them. But on the other hand, you can equally well explain it in a completely different way. You can say, uh, it would be exceedingly dreary if there were nothing but one uniform type of life. And supposing there had never been anything but amoebas, and there were just globules, and they divided, and then they divided again, and then they divided again. You know, that could have gone on and it could have been terribly efficient because the minute you went to hit an amoeba, you would strike it but suddenly find you'd killed only one of them because it split just before you hit. It's a marvelous arrangement. Uh, and you know, they could split very fast. You could suddenly go at another with two hammers hoping to catch the, both amoebas but suddenly they split, 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 split and there were eight of them before you knew where you were. That would be fine. But actually... Or the reason why there is all this colossal variety and all these patterns on butterflies' wings is that nature is a poet and is simply having a wonderful time making all this variety and doing all these various things. And that explanation is just as plausible as the efficient explanation. It's a, you see, the philosophy is to a large extent a matter of taste. What sort of explanations suit your personality? If you're, a, if you're an anal retentive type and rather tight, then you like the efficient explanation. On the other hand, if you're an effusive type, you like the poetic explanation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are, though, beyond that certain considerations of uh, which of these explanations affords better games. And uh, the, the, the economic anal retentive explanation can give good games up to a point. Because there's all the thrill of working out the chains of interconnection, all the reasoning whereby finally with, you go, go through all sorts of rational conniptions and explain why the butterfly has a big eye on its wing. Fine. But where do you end up? You end up in a mechanical straitjacket. You've got to be careful along the other line of approach that you just don't end up in a morass. Uh, you could do that. So you, 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 you look for a middle way. But the point that emerges from all this is <coughs> don't be bamboozled into fearing that the black will win because <clears throat> the white is the only thing there is and the black, the nothing that surrounds it will eventually engulf it. All these are as it were, nursery stories to terrify children. You live in a cosmos where the light of consciousness and the darkness of unconsciousness go back and forth, just as the crests and the troughs of the waves. And this situation 
of yang and yin, positive and negative, is exceedingly productive. It's like a male and a female who become the parents of all sorts of children. And out of yang and yin, black and white, come all these adventures through the original stratagem <coughs> of pretending that the one is and the other isn't, that yang is and that yin isn't. Both have equally good arguments on their side and one now wins and the other now wins. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But don't be deceived. The two are always together. And the thing that you most fear the awful, awful thing that could happen. Think it through. What could that be? What could the very end be? What is it that you dread? And you'll find out that if you go down, 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 down into what you dread, be swallowed up, be annihilated, let the horrible scorpion, spider mother, the octopus thing catch you and take you down into its inmost guts. What will it do with you? Why, it'll transform you into itself. And then when you are it, as I said, every creature feels like it's a human being. <laughs> because after all, uh, that's I. So fish when they've eaten up something and that thing has become them, you know, and then the fish looks around and says, gee, that was a good dinner. And it feels human. And the fish looks around and it sees things that aren't fish and they look like cows and uh, human beings wandering around there. They look like um, predatory monsters of some kind. Awful looking things. Ghastly teeth and uh, weird Un inhumane arms and legs on them not nice uh, orderly fins and tails and beautiful scales on the side like a, a really good person should look <laughs> so you know this thing this thing of death and of being transformed is where our life reaches a certain point where it has to go bloop and in the moment you go bloop, you forget. You lose control, you see. That's the sensation. When control is going, you're just on the verge of the crisis where it's going to bloop. And you say, well, where was I? Gee, this is strange. I'm alive. I don't remember where I was before. That's the sensation of coming to birth. And you grow and grow and you become more familiar with this and more familiar. When you're completely familiar, it goes bloop. And you're new all over again. See, quite different. We can never believe, you see, when it gets to the point where we know it's about to go bloop, we can never believe that it will go into, into life we always think it's going to go into something dreadful. But you see, once you know, <laughs> it's, it's going to keep flipping. And uh, the only thing is to go with that flip. See, get ready to go. Are you ready? Boop. <laughs> then you can laugh. Because you know there's no way out. 